David, thank you very much for that warm welcome. I'm Dan Rather. Somewhere over the side is my grandson, Martin, who got me over here tonight. Uh, well, thank you for coming to the film. Uh, this film, which is a, a product of Alex Chabanel, who's one of the most gifted, most talented uh, filmmakers making film anywhere. Uh, but the film deals with something that goes very deep into our society, which basically is a film about deep and abiding corruption, which is allowed to go on. I don't mean this as an editorial statement, but it's very clear uh, by any reasonable analysis, this is a national scandal that has gone on far too long. And the question is what to do about it. And part of what can be done about it is that people who are interested in education in the country need to get involved. Granted, many have been involved up to and including now, but there needs to be more people who care about education uh, more actively involved. Uh, that the public gets confused between what is public education, what is private education, and what is for-profit education. The for-profit people prefer to have that confusion. So anything and everything that you can do to be active, to be involved, call attention to the problem, and deal with the problem. As I say, I think it's a national disgrace the problem has gone on for this long. About the film, uh, I became involved when uh, Alex contacted me some years ago, and quite frankly, a, a talented editor, uh, Adam Bolt, uh, who had worked for me on previous occasions, was involved with the film, and because uh, Mr. Bolt was involved with the film, and I was so impressed with Alex's passion and his talent, uh, that that's how I came to be involved with the film. In addition to learning from the film, and I hope being inspired by the film, uh, I hope you enjoy the film. And thank you very much for being here this evening. Thanks a lot. I'm Alex Shebano. I uh, directed this film. Uh, this has been thank you. This has been my project for just a little less than five years now, full time. Um, I've been following this industry for, you know, as you saw through a lot of changes, um, a lot of human hardship. Um, but I think this is the perfect audience to show it to because I think a lot of the people in this room have power to do something about this. Um, I've, we have a great stellar panel for you guys. I want to introduce our moderator, Ernest. He's a program associate at New America. It's a think tank DC. I would like to introduce Dr. Martha Cantor. She's the executive director of the College Promise Campaign, which is, we highlight one promise program, the Tennessee Promise. Uh, she is the, the head of a bipartisan organization that um, is promoting free, free community college. And I'd like to introduce our last panelist, Dr. King Alexander from Louisiana State University. He was also in the film. Alex said, my name is Ernest Zuego. I'm a program associate at New America. I'm happy to be moderating this Q&A panel. Um, we've got some esteemed uh, people and names in the higher education field here. Um, uh, so I want to give you guys a little bit of time to like, uh, give yourself, uh, introduce yourselves again and talk about maybe a little bit of your history with higher education. Uh, I'm probably the oldest one on the panel. I often call myself the grandmother of higher education. I was uh, President Obama's undersecretary of education for five years, but before that, I spent more than 30 years in the community college system. And I also taught at the state university system, so I've known King Alexander for many years. And uh, more recently, I was a professor at NYU. Uh, but now I'm running the College Promise Campaign, and I really think this film was fantastic because the hope is that we make college a reality for the thousands of students that are coming up through the ranks. So with that. I'm King Alexander. I've been a public university president in Kentucky and 10 years in California and the last five years in Louisiana at LSU, Louisiana State University. Uh, but 
But my area of study has always been higher education, finance, and policy. So I've followed this issue for, uh, it seems like it's gone back and studying it for 50 years, but I've taught it in 25 years. Um, I had the privilege of working with Martha, the undersecretary and their staff, for a good eight, eight years where we fought hard to get some of these changes in play. So as I always told everybody, or the economists have said, we need to put an end to this wild west of higher education in the United States. So we've got a lot of work to do. This fight has been going on with, for, for straightening this out and helping low income opportunity and all opportunity of students. And that fight needs to continue. And we'll talk more about it as this evening goes on. So um, Alex, again, I want to thank you for inviting me to moderate this panel. Um, you know, I've seen this documentary close to six times now. Uh, it's really good, uh, as you guys know. Um, and one element that stood out to me the most each time uh, is the focus on student stories and how those are incorporated into the bigger picture and maybe some of the more policy-focused elements of this film. Um, it's, uh, I find that I'm in the policy research space, and I find that uh, sometimes it's easy to forget that there are real human stories attached to the numbers, real, a real human cost to policy implications and policy uh, proposals. And um, I think Phil State does a great job of really weaving student stories into this bigger narrative. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about uh, the process of finding these stories, of telling these stories, uh, and how you decided to uh, fit them into the narrative. Similar to what you uh, went through, and I think a lot of people who deal with the story, um, they go through this similar journey, is that you, you kind of focus in on the big picture, you look at all the numbers, and they're staggering numbers, and, and you hear about the horror stories. Um, the, what drew me really to the story was, you know, talk of predatory recruitment of veterans, of, pe of, vet of military service members who were in hospitals, um, recovering from injuries, to, you know, some of these for-profits were, you know, cr having their students create fake business cards and then submitting that to the Department of Education as proof that they found work. And, you know, these are like things that like you get, you're, get so infuriated by, but then for me personally, like, I never was able to put a full face to that. Um, and so we actually started doing a lot of interviews, just policy-centered interviews. Um, it, it was over a year, but maybe a year and a half, we'd done about 25 to 30 interviews, policy-centered, before we even started doing the student stories. And by that point, I think it was like 18 months into the production, I was like, okay, now's the time to do the stories. And I guess one of the saddest things about the story was, um, this process was it was very easy to find these students. Um, in a matter of two weeks, I found over 100 students. Um, Facebook comments, Yelp reviews, um, they're there, they're out there if you, if you know where to look. And the hardest part though of that was getting them to talk to me. Um, there's a lot of shame and embarrassment in this, there's a lot of despair. Um, I mean, the more I was able to talk with students and get them to, to even just talk to me on the phone, it's just like, it's, not, it's hard not to walk away from this, not thinking that this is nothing but a like tower of misery, a, a tower of human despair. Um, and then the, the hardest part was getting some of these to actually come on camera. And um, I learned how to make a documentary in the process of making this film because I'd done documentaries before, but dealing with raw human emotion like this um, was something I'd never experienced before. Um, and I was far removed from the for-profit space in the first place. I came, you know, came from a community college, went to a traditional four-year. Um, but talking to these students, I wanted to frame the questions as, as if we're all at a dinner table and we're just listening to them. Because I think the for-profits have been able to discount a lot of this horrific stuff by saying it's a few bad apples, you know, we fixed all of this, we, we can move on, but it's hard to turn away from pure human despair, and that's what I was trying to really capture. Yeah, I mean, that's um, absolutely. Um, Dr. Cantor and President Alexander, I want to direct this next question to the both of you. Both of you were presidents of public institutions during the rise of the for-profit college industry. Um, you witnessed it firsthand. Uh, and I'm curious as to how you both came to an understanding that for-profit colleges were a misuse and a poor investment of public dollars, um, and how, uh, what it was like competing for these students with these schools. Yeah, I could tell you, you know, over more than 30 years, I'd have students coming into my classroom as a teacher explaining to me when they learned to trust me that they were coming for a, because of a second chance. And a lot of the students were coming because of the second chance 
they had gone somewhere that didn't give them a quality education, they had loans, they had families, and I think you saw it in the film. You saw Gail Mello, who's my colleague at LaGuardia Community College, seeing the students come in. So I rose up the ranks, you know, I became a dean, I became um, a vice president, a president, and at that level, we had a lot of students coming in saying, I've got a whole lot of debt. My financial aid officer used to come into my office and said, you know, shaking her head, saying, if I see one more student that's carrying these student loans from a for-profit, I'm going to scream. Um, and what could you do? You know, could you compete? I think for us, it was never a question of competition with the for-profit industry. It was a question of how to rebuild students' lives that had gone to a school that gave them a very poor quality education. But over those years, we had, at the community colleges that I led, you know, experienced tremendous disinvestment that King you know, has talked about in the film. And so we were really struggling because it's absolutely true what the film said. You know, I counted up with all the counselors that I could hire, the full-time counselors. They could see every one of my 25,000 students 15 minutes each quarter. That was it. That was the amount of time they had. And so if you're trying to help a student that comes in with a huge amount of debt, how are you going to cover that? You've got a family, how are you going to live? Or if you're going to have a student coming in saying, I don't know where to go, should I come to you? But you've got long waiting lists because you know you can't offer all the classes that are needed because you just don't have money from the state. Um, you're in a quagmire as a leader. And you try to do the best you can with what you have. I spent a ton of time fundraising just because we didn't have the resources that we needed to serve all of our students. President Alexander. This was first brought to my attention in really the late 80s over at a conference at Oxford University when we met with university presidents from around the world, primarily OECD presidents. And they actually asked me a question that sits with me to this day. They, say, they said, how do you know what a university is in the United States? Because there's one on every street corner. And it, it, so when we started looking into this, we realized we're the only OECD country in the world that has adopted a model where the government doesn't control where the government money goes. We rely on 30 or so private accrediting bodies that generate their funds by how many institutions they accredit. And so when this started crashing down 10 years ago, uh, every, the accrediting body said the Department of Education should do something about this. The Department of Education said, no, we thought you're the one that's supposed to control quality. So when I mentioned the Wild West, this is the Wild West of public spending up to $175 billion. And states are down to $75 billion, by the way. But it's based on a market voucher that was adopted in 1972. And the way you enhance your share of that market voucher is whether it's a combination of a grant and a loan, it's tuition sensitive and fee sensitive. So the more you charge, the more reliant you'll be on it. Thus, we've created a market model that rewards institutions that have the freedom to raise their tuition, to raise it more often, and keep legitimate information outside the marketplace so the market could actually work the way it was supposed to. We have known more until recently We've known more about the used cars that we buy than the colleges and universities that we invest in because there are active participants in the college and university world that fought to keep this information out of the hands of the consumers, students, and parents. And this, this, is, this is the challenge we face. But we started this idea that a voucher was going to work. A tuition-based, fee-based voucher was going to work then we never held institutions accountable. The ones that promised to raise and increase their low-income population if you give them the vouchers, particularly some of the wealthiest institutions on earth, still have less than the low-income population they did 50 years ago. So we've set up a bad system that has put us in one particular statistic I want you to take away tonight. When we set this system up, our 55 to 64 year old Americans were number one in the world in percentage which college degrees. We were leading the world. Today, 50 years into this, our 25 to 34 year olds rank 13th. 
and that's dropping every two years. Wow. And that's a real shame. That is something everybody should regret that we're placing on the backs of our next generation. Wow. So I want to actually get into this question of the market's role in all of this. Um, both of you, Alex, you too, as a student, uh, we're, we're uh, at these public institutions um, in a period of uh, the, the worst period, in fact, of state uh, disinvestment that the in the country's history, um, as Phil State, you know, as the documentary does a good job to note. Um, there's an important moment in the film where it's Matt Reed, I believe, says, a student that gets away, or sorry, a student that gets frustrated at a community college will be found and recruited very easily into a for-profit. Um, so can all of you talk a little bit more about the role of state disinvestment and the system in general? Um, and what role uh, those two things have played in allowing for-profits to grow? Yeah, I could just tell you, you know, I was in California for 30 years in Silicon Valley. Um, we turned away four, more than 400,000 students in that period of time during, during the Great Recession. Um, shame on us. How did we turn them away in public higher education? We couldn't offer the classes they needed because we didn't have the money to hire the teachers to teach those classes. So it was a really simple formula. Students are vulnerable. They waited in line. I remember we were serving them oranges because the lines were so long. Um, and we also had technology. The technology stopped because we were overrun by students, and I think you saw that in the film. So we had tremendous, tremendous challenges, much less the challenges, the human challenges that the students were facing just to come to college. I think you saw in the film, the homelessness and the transportation and all the challenges of actually making a life in college and in work and with family. So we had a terrible, terrible time just making ends meet. We did a ton of information, informational sessions with congressmen, congresswomen. They couldn't, they couldn't get the money together. They couldn't figure out solutions. And really, things have fallen apart so much worse now. People just don't talk to each other. They don't want to solve problems together in Washington. It was so frustrating for many of us in the administration in the last couple of years of this administration where our political leadership just broke down. I guess, you know, some personal information. Um, I attended Foothill College, which was actually Martha's school. Um, and I remember I, I attended during the height of the recession. And I remember coming to, actually, it was my first day of class, and there was a line of students just lined around the whole um, exterior of the classroom. And the name of the game was, if you had a seat at the end of that class, you were in the class. If not, you're out. And this happened multiple times. The class registration system would shut, would you know, overload and, and shut down on class registration day. Um, you know, I came from, I had the benefit of coming from a family that could, you know, withstand that. But for a lot of people, students in, in this film and students I spoke with, they didn't have that luxury. And you know they're getting frustrated at the community college system. And I remember speaking with Laura Brozek in the film, the ITT Tech Recruiter, and she said, when I asked her about the pain funnel, she said, yeah, you know, we were using that, but my big pitch at the time wasn't using the pain funnel, it was just talking about how lousy the community college system was for them. It was, they were, they could say, you're gonna wait three years to get into this one program, this nursing program, come, come next term, which is in three weeks, we'll sign you up, you'll have the loans, you don't even need to pay pay anything out of pocket, we'll get you, you'll be done in 18 months. And she was able to sell it over and over and over again. ITT Tech was one of the biggest companies in this whole story. Um, and I think that's really what that line that Matt Reed says is one of my favorite in the whole film because that is the quintessential summary of this film. It's that if we can just fund our publics so that they're capable of doing what they need to be doing, the for-profits can't compete. And if we would have just kept funding our for-profits at an average rate without the reductions every three out of four years has been a reduction nationally, we wouldn't be talking about free college. We wouldn't have the middle class backlashes that we're having with merit-based scholarships in Georgia and Louisiana and Kentucky and Michigan, or having the American Opportunity Tax Credit even being a federal issue of which now we're spending $35 billion to give people tax credits back because the middle class wanted something back because college costs have gone up because state legislatures around the country have, have completely abandoned their responsibilities. And if anybody's from Colorado, you guys are first or second, and you'll be out of the 
public higher education visits in 2025 if these trends persist. We're right behind you 2027 in Louisiana. But a direct, the, perhaps the most direct impact I can remember was in California. We always said in Sacramento, whether it was Governor Schwarzenegger or Governor Brown, look, we'll educate, we'll educate the students you fund. You fund us, we'll find a place for them and we'll educate them. The California State University system has half a million students, 23 universities. We'll find them a place and we'll do it, but you have to fund them. But when they didn't fund them those three out of four years, it kept rolling through. We basically shut the doors down in January to all community college students who roll through a two plus two program, of which it shut out 60,000 two plus two students a year that had intended on going to, to four-year institutions from the community college and we shut our doors in January. That's the impact. And then the predators start preying on them, as they have done throughout the state of California and many other large population states. So we've got to address this state disinvestment issue and quit letting our state legislators sneak off. And sneak off and cut higher education over and over again to levels that are unprecedented. We're at 1965 tax effort funding levels based on the wealth of our states. Aggregate level, we're about 1990. But this is a continual trend that's right. The costs are going up, the kids aren't affording it, they're getting left out there, the predators come around on the backside of them and prey on them. And prey on them, uh, the community colleges, one, the ones we can't educate, as well as the ones that are four-year institutions. Let's get into some solutions. Uh, you guys clapped so quickly at the moment. <laughs> Alex said anything positive, so I know we're ready for that. Um, Dr. Green, I want to start uh, with talking about uh, College Promise. Um, the film mentions uh, the film mentions the Tennessee Promise, um, and you know, seeing the harm that the for-profit industry has done to students, and uh, combining that with disinvestment uh, in our publics over the past four decades. Uh, why do you think that the the promise uh, is the solution? Well, I have to be a little bit. Um, retrospective, when I, when I became the undersecretary, uh, in my first week, I watched President Obama, um, and he was, you know, he had played a lot of basketball, and he was in a blue shirt with his sleeves rolled up, and he ran onto the stage, there were 1,200 people all around in a stadium at Macomb Community College, and he said, we are going to make it possible for every student to pursue the American dream, and it starts right now, it starts right here. He said it much more eloquently than I'm saying it right now. Um, and he said we should, with those OECD numbers, we should be first in the world. And so, you know, from that point on, I thought, how can we do this? How can we do this? I've been working on college for all my whole life. I want to give everybody a chance. It, nobody should be cut out of a first step into college, much less getting support to go all the way through and to continue going now in the 21st century. So I studied this like crazy um, and worked on College for All and met Governor Haslam back in 2011. And he had been the mayor of Knoxville uh, in Tennessee back in 2005 and actually took the College for All idea into Tennessee when he became governor in, I think it was 2012, 2013, um, and went forward with it to say, at least for our state, because our college-educated population is so low when you look comparatively across the country. We ought to have a drive to what President Obama had posited as the American dream, let's get 60% of Americans with a baccalaureate degree by 2020, or a two-year degree, two-year or four-year by 2020. I had done all the metrics. I knew how many exactly in the four-year system, how many in the two-year system, how could we get to 2020? Um, it is not happening. We are rolling back everything. But what has happened is when I went to NYU and I started looking for College for All, looked at Tennessee, that was rolling along. It didn't launch until 2014. It took them that long to get the Tennessee Promise up and running one state at a time. Two and a half years today, we've got 16 states. We've got from 53 back in 2014, 53 local communities. Now we've got Los Angeles to Detroit, to Houston, to Dallas, to Boston, to, to Milwaukee, two, more than 200 communities where people from 
business, government, education, and philanthropy have said enough is enough. We're not going to rely on the federal government. We're going to try to do what we can locally and see if we can push up to states like Haslam has done. The same thing, the same concept. So I think we're building a movement. We're building toward making college possible for all. It's just going to take time because right now, as somebody said to me this morning, the chaos guys are in control and all the regulations are coming out. The industry is going to come roaring back. But you know what? What gives me hope? We believe we can do this. And you know, my mother was getting solicited from the for-profit industry. I had to undo all the stuff on her computer. She's over 90. Um, you know, T. Cantor would get all these emails. It was a nightmare. I said, you know, don't return anything. Um, I've got to get all this stuff off you because you're not going to a for-profit institution uh, at the age of 90. Uh, so we're going to have much more of this to deal with. And she said. I only have two things to say to you. Onward, and the country survived Andrew Jackson. <laughs> um, so, President Alexander, what is the pitch for increased state and federal uh, fund, federal support in higher education? I think probably, well, first of all, these regulations need to stay. Um, the fact that you have institutions out there that, are, that follow us every step of the way to get them on the books tells you something. Other institutions that fight us every step of the way to even add the college scorecard of which you can look up what every institution, what happens to the graduates and earnings power as well as their indebtedness and default rates. Uh, that means we cannot lose that. That's outcomes consumer-based information. But I'd say previously we've had some good experiments that have worked, and, and we're working behind the scenes to encourage the same type of experiment. Um, lost a little ground recently, but um, when you go back to the stimulus package, most people don't know what that entailed. But what we did in the stimulus package, three economic stimulus packages, we said you could only take education funds and use them for stimulus by the state legislatures and your governors if and only if your state did not reduce your budget below that year's funding level. Yeah, for, for, for public colleges, universities. So what we essentially did at the federal level, which 48 governors were against, but they lost this fight, but then roughly 48 governors abided by the next three years where they would not cross that, cross that threshold. They want the federal money and they will not cut their public colleges and university budgets with, we call it then a maintenance of effort provision, but I call it federal matching funds. And I would take 10 to $20 billion in this new, this new infrastructure package and call it a human capital infrastructure package and tie it to state behavior. If states want to supplant their money with federal money, which they will do in a heartbeat and have done it for years, then they do not touch this money. They do not get access to these funds. It's worked for highways. We're asking for it for infrastructure. I'm saying we need to do it for public colleges and universities and for human capital infrastructure. Because who's going to build those roads, those roads and bridges? Who's going to build the, the cybersecurity network and infrastructure that we're talking about? But it's going to be this next generation. So every dollar that comes out of the federal government ought to be tied to state behavior. And that's what's not happened in direct student aid. And I may be one of the few presidents in the United States to tell you, I don't want another penny in, in a Pell Grant. Because I'm tired of getting a $200 Pell Grant increase every two years, and every year I'm having to increase tuition and fees $550. So before we put another dime into student aid through the front door, let's shut the back door. And the back door is all this going on. We're, a, we're an industry, an industry that has 11% of the students, 30% of all Pell Grants, and 47% of all student loan defaults. Something's wrong with this picture. And we need to shake it up and think differently about how we go forward to save our public colleges and universities. Excellent. Um, so I think we're running out of time. So we got time for one more question. Alex, I want to start with you on this because I know you have feelings uh, <laughs> with the documentary. Uh, when it comes to for-profit uh, in particular, what's, what's the solution? 
you know, what do you think um, that should be done to protect students from uh, the harms that we know that for profit, the for profit college industry uh, has? I mean, there's there's basically two answers to that. One is not is one that's not based in reality. It's my opinion of this is historically what I've been trying to show is this is an industry that's rotten to the core. Um, this has been decade after decade after decade of abuse. And I think they've proven themselves incapable of handling this money. But that's not going to happen, um, especially in this current administration, which is very beholden to the for-profit college industry. Uh, so what, what I think needs to happen, what we as in this room need to do is this story, I think, has for a long time kind of percolated below. It's been boiling beneath the surface. Um, not many people have been exposed to it. I wasn't exposed to it until I came across it. And what my hope is for this film, and what I hope is that audiences take away from it, is we need a upswell of public outrage in the story, the same level that we saw with the net neutrality fight. It's not happening right now. The Department of Education is going full steam ahead in deregulating these for-profit college regulations. In Congress, the House Education Committee just ha uh, voted to uh, proceed to debate on this, this Higher Education Act reauthorization that would remove gainful employment outright, would remove the 90-10 rule outright, and it would basically take it so that teachers wouldn't even need to be in the classroom in the first place. And we need to have a public kind of organizing to start speaking out against this because the current department and the, the industry, they're not feeling the heat. And obviously there's a lot of crazy stuff going on right now, but there are a lot of human lives that are being ruined and, and the numbers are staggering. I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who dreamt really big. Um, Fred, for example, incredible head on his shoulders. If he had just gone to a community college, you know, his whole, not only would his life be different, his family's life would have been different. Like, the, the, in, the benefits of a college education extend to the family. It's, it, it improves generations after it. And for $18,000, a company ruined his life, or, you know, stunted his life. And I think this, this story needs to stop. It needs to stop now. It was happening in the 70s and 80s. It's actually happened way back in the, the first GI Bill. It's, it's happened in the mid-2000s and, and into the late 2010s. And now the industry's gone dormant in the later years of the Obama administration, but the current administration is trying to bring that back. I'll just say, I never understood the 90-10 the rule or the 85-15 rule. I never understood the reality of it until I went way deep into the regulations and saw what was happening. We need a 50-50 rule. You know, if anybody's, and, and I think we need to just be um, smart about a simple way to stop these behaviors. Um, and the money is just flowing, 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 so it's gonna be very difficult. But I just don't, I think the, the American public, if you said to them that 90% of the funding can come from the federal government for a for-profit company? Does that make sense? How about 50% or less? Uh, Ernest, can I say one quick thing too? Yes. This is separate of the, I know a lot of people in the room probably have questions for us and the filmmaking team. Uh, we are, the Fail State team is proud to invite everyone in this room to a post screening reception right next door at the Iron Cactus. We have drinks. Uh, some food, I know some people ate. Um, we would love for you all to come and, and talk to all of us. Um, we'd be happy to take your questions. I know this is such a short panel and this is such a big film, uh, but please do come if, if you have time. Excellent. Uh, everyone give a round of applause to our esteemed panel. And I'd like to thank Alex for bringing attention and Dan Rather to bringing attention to an issue that, is, that has been bubbling up for 50 years and it's an issue that an entire industry doesn't want to talk about. Doesn't, and puts legislation to keep us from talking about outcomes, to keep parents and students in the dark, and to keep consumers in the dark. So I appreciate the work that the film has done, and Alex, and, and certainly the producers have done an outstanding job bringing a very important issue to light. So Alex, thank you. All right, we'll see you all at the Iron Cactus. <laughs>